thank you to all the speakers. So this was uh, a dazzling um, trio of talks for me. So I, okay, I have to come up with uh, stuff to say. So I, I'm going to be partially coherent because I'm making this up on the fly. But my first, you know, one funny thought. So we, we've been hearing about behavior that is quite complex uh, in and of itself, the level of behavior. Um, as well as fMRI responses, and here we are bringing in another level of complexity, right? So now to, we're looking inside the brain, which brings with it a whole host of other questions, um, spiking neurons behave, how you would code this in dynamics, in, in, in neural networks, and so on and so forth, in individual cells. Anyway, so it's, we are so confused, so let's bring in even more uncertainty. Um, anyway, I, I just think Okay, so when I was trying to plan this session, um, I had trouble finding speakers. Uh, there are very few people who work on these questions uh, in the physiology, in the single neuron physiology community. Um, but as I, um, as I, as I think we saw today, these talks were such high quality that I think that this is will be a rapidly expanding um, area of, of research. Um, okay, so on one hand, we haven't, at, at, the, we, at the single cell level, we're just starting to address these questions and to find tasks that we can use with monkeys to look at information sampling and, and to find methods and areas. On the other hand, um, so two of the talks, that, the first two talks that we heard today were not directly related to information sampling, and yet I found them highly relevant in the findings in each one of them started me, you know, evoked a many number of questions. And so this is perhaps um, just a reflection of what Carl was saying earlier. The brain is an information processor, so everything we see in it uh, will evoke questions about sampling and af active sampling, so maybe this is tautological in a sense. Okay, so, so let me go through the, the main questions that that arose um, in relation to each uh, each of the speakers, and then I'll zoom out and, and pose some even broader questions that we may all, all want to discuss. Okay, so from the work of Wolfram Schultz, I think we, we saw a beautiful demonstration uh, that dopamine neurons encode utility in a way that corresponds uh, strikingly well with what an economist would call utility at the level of behavior. Um, and then we also saw that um, some orbitofrontal neurons encode these explicit signals of the uncertainty of a reward distribution. And it, that was um, it, very clear from the data, but I wonder if this is um, a question or I wonder how uh, Wolfram would, um, would uh, resolve it. So in the economic explanation of risk-seeking behavior, there isn't a, a, an explicit representation of risk, right? So no economic model says that it has a variable that measures the variance of the reward distribution. As Wolfram has shown, it, all the models have is a utility function and risk preference is really the, uh, just emerges from the curvature of the utility function. And yet we see these OFC cells almost like an explicit representation of that curvature or of the risk or something. So, so I was wondering how, how, how we should think about these signals. Um, how do they relate to signals of utility and what do they, what do, they do for choices? And, another, uh, and then and another question is what is their function relative to these other more implicit representations of uncertainty that Jill spoke about yesterday where you may have simply a flattening uh, a flattening of the likelihood function or a flattening of the map, uh, which would be, which, which would encode more sensory noise, or, uh, but, but that's an implicit representation. Okay, another question that I had uh, in relation to, uh, to these data is that in the behavior there was an interaction between the risk preference and the level, of the, and the reward level. Right? So the risk, uh, risk attitudes were different depending where you were in the range uh, of rewards. And yet in OFC, um, there, there's very clear separation of 
signals. I was struck by that separation. Some co cells encoded this, and those were not the same cells as encode value. And this is, uh, seems to be a little different from the behavior, and it's also different from other responses to uncertainty that are found not in choice tasks, but in observing tasks, where mon monkeys are simply presented with probabilistic cues, um, or are, are, are allowed to, to sample information uh, based on prior uncertainty. And there what we find is an interaction between uncertainty and risks, where we have, we have neurons that peak at the highest uh, point of highest uncertainty, so uh, the, 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 the neurons behave as if they, they, they encode two interactive functions. One is a, um, a representation of the uncertainty of the reward distribution, and the other a monotonic function of reward probability. And those are found uh, on the same cells. And this has been shown in uh, cells in subcortical areas, uh, and we also found it um, we showed it in uh, eye movement, information sampling behavior uh, about our work. Okay, and then um, I, I had some questions about uh, the novelty response in the dopamine cells. Um, and the question is, how is it, is it really novelty or does it reflect something about uh, what the monkeys have learned about the overall probability of a novel stimulus uh, being associated with the reward? The monkeys, where every novel stimulus was new to them, but they had experience with a class of novel stimuli, and they might have learned some, formed some prediction about their overall reward probabilities. Okay. Um, Andrew Bell, I think I asked most most of my questions, um, so um, I'll just uh, repeat them. So uh, the question arose: in, in, if you have those uh, differences, there, those also differences in the visual responses to certain kind of faces rather than others. So we show so enhanced responses to threat versus fearful uh, faces. Does that really indicate some kind of built-in salience? So in order to start exploring this big wide world, uh, we have to have so we have to come equipped with some built-in mechanisms. And so we have hardware mechanisms for detecting contrast, but also Likely, we have some hardwired mechanisms for social cues, for directing us to faces. Uh, we've seen how uh, sort of Pavlovian uh, preferences, stimuli that are associated with rewards, can uh, also evolve very quickly, and that's a, maybe a, an evolutionally determined reward function. Did to simply point out to us what might be useful in, in, in this very rich environment. And so this would seem to this this would seem that it's an opening into that question of how um, the salience might be um, uh, computed and how it may arise based on emotional factors and perhaps even be different uh, be different in each individual. Um, as Andrew remarked, different uh, different individuals might find different things salient because of their experience, their emotional experience or their other learning. Okay, and then the second question was related to the predictive coding that we discussed. I think this is a fascinating question uh, from my point of view because it could give a, a really more um, principled role to those salient signals that, that we see in the parietal cortex or the atten attentional control signals that we see um, and it, it may really help tie them in as a mediator of, um, of, um, of um, refining the, the, the matter of, or increasing the precision of certain in, uh, signals that are needed for a particular task. Um, and then finally, Lawrence Hunt, I think, uh, showed us uh, an amazing collection of tasks uh, that looks at instrumental information sampling. Uh, so both the human data and the macaque data, I think, are outstanding. Um, the human data, because it's such a massive data set, much larger than uh, we have seen in neuroscience, and so it's, it's going to be um, a really rich, um, but I think it's going to take us many years from now. And it's also amazing that he could implement a 
version of this task in monkeys. Uh, this, is, this task is an order of magnitude more complex than the, the simple decision tasks that are done in monkeys. So it, it is more complex, but it is more complex in a tractable way that can provide a lot of information. And also the comparisons uh, between uh, the areas that we've seen, um, in my mind it's one of the most convincing examples of um, functional differences, uh, real functional differences between these areas. Um, okay, so uh, a salient feature of the findings was this idea that monkeys sample the high value option. And in, because it's an instrumental task, it's unclear whether you sample the high value option or the option that you're going to choose. And I think that there are at least two explanations for it, for this phenomenon that will be interesting to pursue. So one is that really it's a Pavlovian approach. It's a simple stimulus reward association and you, you just approach it by default. And we certainly see evidence for this in many, many cases in, in non-instrumental tasks where the monkeys do not choose the option. But nevertheless, if there's a possibility of the high reward, there's a preferential sampling of a stimulus that predicts high reward, even when that stimulus is redundant and uninformative. And actually, we see this in monkeys and in humans. And this has really uh, far-reaching implications for models of information sampling. Uh, so that's one possible explanation, how well we approach. Another possible explanation, which may, may be a bit more interesting, is that we have um, a parallel evolution of a sampling process and a decision process, and the more evidence accumulates toward the decision, the more it biases sampling in favor of that decision. So um, those are two potentially not mutually exclusive uh, mechanisms. Um, okay, another uh, theme that I think is really quite important from this work is um, the fact that it started to look at how uh, we integrate att attributes for multi-attribute decision-making, which is most of our decision-making. Uh, and I think this will also be a very, very important topic for understanding information sampling, because information sampling, as we've heard from uh, several tasks, is a process that, that has to be understood in the context of sequential decisions. So you do something now, you, you sample, you get an observation out, but then you do something, and something more happens, something more happens, and only way down the road do you get a reward. And in this very complex decision tree, there's a lot of stuff you have to integrate. And uh, we, for example, we have some evidence that you value that, um, yeah, that people, uh, so a lot of the, the models that we work with today assume that is the, the value that you obtain in the end, all of the values back out and assign all of the rewards that you eventually get back, back up and assign value to earlier information sampling steps. But we have um, some, uh, but, but there's evidence that this integration of, it, of, of reward values is actually not perfect and, and that there are funny things happening where information uh, is signaled about individual steps that have nothing to do with the total reward you can get. All right. Um, and the final thing that I that I wanted to ask about in these data is uh, the finding that in the lateral prefrontal cortex there are signals of spatial orienting, so right or left, but relatively weak reward signals. And that is puzzling to me because um, again, coming from these areas of the priority maps that will ultimately drive I know that there are reward signals in those priority maps, and somehow reward information has to get to them. And my first candidate would have been that one through frontal cortex. Um, and, uh, but, but there's not a lot of reward activity there, so that's puzzling where, where those signals get to the attention. Okay. All right, so those were a lot of specific questions. Um, okay, bigger questions. Um, how are we going to move forward in this emerging field of uh, the physiology of information sampling? There are so many experiments I could dream up. You know, on any average day, I dream up five different experiments. Uh, which one is the best one? Which one should I choose? What is the most informative? And this is a really important question for us because once we commit to an experiment, we commit five years of our lives to it. 
these, these are very long and difficult uh, things to do, so we'd better be sure that we get something out of them. So I was thinking in the, in the theory session today, uh, can you guys help us, uh, tell us, you know, make predictions and say, this is, the this is a prediction of my model, this is what I'd like to know, I can do it like this, I can make my robot act like this or like that, and those are two clearly uh, differentiated models, and can you please do an experiment to tell me which strategy a monkey uses, or a human uses, right? Um, okay, and then, so, as we heard this morning, I think from Thierry, I think we're going to have more or less success getting that guidance, and it has to be uh, uh, ongoing uh, back and forth. And uh, I was talking a little bit about this question uh, with Carl, and <laughs> we came back to the question that, well, if you want me to give you some prediction, then tell me what is curiosity. Oh dear, I've heard that before somewhere. And, and to that, I think the, the answer to that is, of course, I can't tell you what is curiosity, but this is the case for most of the things we are most interested in, is that we can't really define them. I mean, you know, define time, define space, define decision-making, anything that's interesting, it's really hard to define, but perhaps the more important uh, thing is not really what it is, but how we measure it. I'm not sure if Richard Feynman said this, I think I heard somewhere that he said this, but anyway, it's something he would have said. Um, all right, so how we measure it. So this is really what's going to come out of this. So learning is messy, curiosity is messy, science is messy. But I think that from, um, from a lot of uh, talking and conferences such as this and our own work, um, I think that we will eventually we will have paradigms and, and theories that will emerge and we will, that, that will seem to be good and fruitful. And I think that probably we'll follow a process that is a lot like learning progress. We're going to stick to those paradigms that seem to tell us the most and we're going to, you know, hammer them um, until, you know, until we reach their limits and then we're going to give up and start looking for, for other paradigms. Um, so I think it's similar to what's happening, has been happening so far. We have been really working the paradigm of a simple choice, two alternative course choice, and we, that's a, a beautiful set of paradigms. We've learned a lot with it. There's a whole theory behind it. Um, and I think now we're coming to the limits of that paradigm and we, we need to extend it, uh, take it to the next level. Um, all right, so I think that's all I have to say. And I hope, um, and, and let's hear more questions. Questions or comments? Yeah. Um, one question that you asked was about why is it that we get uh, separate characterizations of things that are not directly linked to reward, right? Do I understand them correctly? Um, so basically, not everything is linked to a reward, and I, I would like to make a very coarse suggestion that every time that our brain encodes things which are not directly linked to what we absolutely strictly need to do, so immediate reward, it has to do with the fact either that we get very different instances where we need this information. So in other words, it's basically modularly decoupled from how we use this information. Um, and I would say that this may be, a, a, we have to find out where the driver is for this decoupling. In other words, if I have an insect which uses optical flow directly to navigate, and that works perfectly, I mean, there's not much you need to add to that, and it does its job, and there's no point in having extra representation of space and time, then you're good. Um, so, the fact that you can identify uh, task detached information, I think, is an interesting aspect about what the nature of the statistics or the task space is that an organism needs to fulfill. So, I, I'd like to ask a question Do we have a way of studying different tasks or different task structures to uh, get this kind of unbiased? 
representation of state as opposed to task oriented representation of state. Maybe I should let Peter answer that drawing. Just quickly, like, you said that economics, they don't have a lot of these separate representations that will be found, but in fact, there's a whole family of these monoliths type utilities where what you do is you take the mean, you subtract off some time, something times the variance, something times the skew, and so forth. In fact, there are people who can study this in humans that have got like a regular and so forth. So, in fact, people do work with those sorts of utilities, those sorts of ways of evaluating choices too. So, that sort of relates a little bit to Daniel's point too, which is that you know, there are certain new tasks in which the, these, these ways of assessing, these other ways of assessing the impact of skew. Resolve this puzzle about the first point of the, the first commenter uh, in terms of resolving the puzzle in the data about why it is that you're attending to the reward sort of independently of the information. And in development, one of the things that we see all the time is this very general inductive drive that comes with, say, essentialist assumptions about what things are like in the world. So, for example, for babies, if you there's, there's evidence that if you see a bunch of correlated features, the first thing you do is look for other kinds of features that are sort of unexpected, but that you, so you think if there's a bunch of correlated features, what you should do is look for something that's new, that you wouldn't initially predict, but that you think might be part of that, part of, say, the category or the essence of the object that you're looking at. And it seems to me that, you know, the, the assumption, and this is partly this forced choice to alternative task, of course, in that task, if you have information about one option, then you've got, you get just as much information from the unvalued option as you do from the valued option. But of course, in the real world, what you're trying to do is figure out what you do in lots and lots of alternative circumstances, including lots of ones you don't want to know about. And, and certainly in, in human babies, a lot of times what you're doing is just sort of doing inductive inference for its own sake. So you're assuming that if I, say, see a category that has a bunch of properties, now I've got a novel property. I assume that other members of the category are going to demonstrate that, are going to demonstrate that property too. So from that perspective, you see something rewarding, you've got the signal about the particular value or the particular probability. It would make sense to go there and try and find out, okay, now, now the poor monkey can't actually get a third window, but in the real world, there would be a third window or a fourth a fourth window that would give you more information about that, uh, about that stimulus. And that's exactly what, that's exactly what children are doing all the time, independently of, yeah. independently of whether that actually improves their chances of getting a reward in this particular context. Yeah, yeah, so just one, uh, yeah, so, so there are many ways to explain this, to come up with um, rationalizations if you wish, but the one question that's on my, on my mind, we see this happening even when it's not optimal, it's not so-called rational. So the question is, um, there are many reasons why we might have this mechanism. The question is, if this same mechanism could induce biases in information sampling that, um, you know, so ideally, I think if we could, we would simply sample information that reduces uncertainty. But we see that that's not what people do, and, and that's not what monkeys do. We do that to some extent, but then we also have this bias. And you have to wonder whether that can really work against us. I mean, it's possible that we need this bias in order to navigate this enormously complex world. I totally get that, but, but at the same time, it may cost us uh, some inefficiencies in our decision making. So that's just an interesting question to pursue. Uh, I may just be kind of repeating what, what uh, Alison um, put a bit less evidently, but I think that's basically the, the point behind some of those um, uh, reward-guided information searches that we seem to see in both the humans and the monkeys. But the situation that we're putting both sets of subjects into is intentionally an artificial scenario where information search is decoupled from reward. And actually, if you were to go and look at, at some of those other environments that I was kind of showing you at the beginning, like a human going shopping or the monkey foraging for food, generally um, a, a useful evolutionary prior 
might be to go and want to sample that um, information from locations that you're eventually going to want to approach and engage with, and not bother to go and sample from locations that uh, are not necessarily going to lead, lead to a war. It's just the case that in two alternative false choice paradigms, you can, you can set it up so that actually that's a suboptimal thing to do and, and doesn't maximise information gain about what, what the right course of action is. And for example, another related question is what happens about information about gains or losses? So if you prefer good news information, does that mean that you pay less attention to information about losses? Right? So is that, is that a bias in, in your information sampling? And how, is that, how does that work with loss aversion? So decision making would suggest that loss information is actually more salient, uh, 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 more salient for your decision but how does gain and loss information influence information sampling versus action selection, right? So it raises very interesting questions. Um, concerning the definition, what is curiosity? I, I've been a bit surprised since yesterday to hear maybe only, only two times the name uh, Berlin, which is, uh, who, who was a, a British uh, psychologist who dedicated his almost entire research career on working on curiosity and trying to think it and to define it, to subtype it and uh, I think he has produced a very wide and uh, uh, rich amount of not only thinking and theories but also he collected a lot of data and, uh, and I wonder whether uh, it will not be, even if it's far from the new frameworks and the computational frameworks etc, whether it will not be useful to maybe read uh, Berlin more and to try to, yeah, to acknowledge uh, what he has already done just to avoid to reinvent the wheel and maybe to end up with the same conclusion in 10 years. From. So what do you think are one or two or three salient points? But, you so for example on the differentiation between different types of curiosity and the fact that there are curiosities which are aiming at gaining information which is lacking and curiosities which are aiming at uh, getting distracted or getting uh, aroused and uh, maybe translating this idea in the modern framework would already uh, open a very interesting uh, yeah. new doors. Just a short comment on that, so you're absolutely right that Bannon is a very important person, but actually we did not pronounce the name and, uh, and that's, that's wrong from us, but it was really present. So for example, when I presented my, uh, my table uh, of the, the computational classification of potential uh, intrinsic reward signals, it, it's actually based on many of Berlin's ideas, and I am discussing Berlin in, in, in this very paper. But you're, you're right, and one particular very uh, interesting idea, for example, that, that he has been exploring and that, that we did not discuss at all, is um, the way the brain can explore uh, its own functioning. Uh, through active exploration, like the brain making experiments on itself. Uh, this is in the book Structure and Direction in Thinking. And, and yes, I agree. Um, we've heard a bit about um, economic uh, situations where you're, where you're looking at. And values. Um, the uh, prize, Nobel Prize winner um, Daniel Kuhneman yeah, did a lot of work on looking at human uh, decisions and found they're very irrational. Yep. They, they do not, you know, they have, they do not perform according to mathematical models which are precise and uh, um, optimised. And this raises the question of, you know, how do you take account of this and, and uh, relate it to uh, neuroscience and also um, the fact that they could be taken as being pathological uh, is not really an excuse. I mean, it is behaviour that, uh, that people do all the time. And so it's not pathological behaviour as such. I mean, um, so, um, I guess one of the things that Kahneman was, was, was really good at was trying to find mathematical 
formalisms that would capture some of those um, abnormal biases and certainly um, maybe it became popular thanks to Wolfram and a few other people um, this idea that you could take some of those biases um, that were described and, and use them to explain neural data and that's a really popular thing in, in neuroimaging of the past. Um, so although we have five, five to ten years, so although we haven't really focused on it today, there certainly are a number of people who are out there considering it. So, uh, so I think that so Kahneman and the whole the behavioral economics field, um, they're really yes very effective in showing how decisions depart from classical utility theory, what could be called a rational choice, and what they provided is sort of a catalog of these irrational oddities that we do. Um, what is not there is an explanation. And I think so. I right now I have a I have a I collaborate with a theoretical economist. So this idea is uh, percolating not only through uh, behavioral economics but mainstream classical macroeconomics, where we try to explain market phenomena. And the idea is, and we think that attention and information sampling is really a core process here, because as I said, or at least can again provide the handle to crack open this, this question. Because, as, as I said, if you might remember from my introduction, our decision theories, their fundamental assumption is that each individual starts with a perfect and complete understanding of the decision situation. And we achieve this by just, you know, taking two options and presenting them very clearly. So there is absolutely no question about what the relevant options might be. And the decision problem is cast as simply forming a preference or learning a preference over the perfectly known set of options. Now, if you introduce the step of information sampling, you introduce the possibility that not every individual constructs the decision situation the same way. Depends what you have attended to, right? So these monkeys in, in Lawrence's experiment, some of them uh, decide based on magnitude, some based on probability, some based on a little bit of information, some based on more information. So their decisions are construed and constructed to be different from the very beginning. And I think that by getting a handle into that construction process, into the sampling process, we can really begin to understand why these things are apparently irrational. They may not be irrational at all, provided that you understand how the situation is represented for each individual. Yeah, at the risk of doubling it. There's a different take on, on this apparently irrational behavior. One can say it doesn't match so apparently human beings behave irrationally. But the different take would be to say, assuming they behave optimally, yeah. what is their objective? Yeah. I think yeah. this is more or less... Yeah, this is more or less, yeah. Thank you. So I'm exactly pursuing my point. Um, so your theoretical economist friend, what, what does he think about complete class theory? About, about what? The complete class theory. Uh, I think you'd have to ask him. Well, I'll put you in touch with him. I have no idea. Well, it's a really important theorem, um, which says that for any, and even taking information sampling out of the game and putting uncertainty back into it, so we know in a basic decision theoretic context. Yeah. The complete class theory says that for any pair of loss functions and behavior, there is a Bayes optimal explanation under some set of priors. What that means is there is no irrational behavior. There are just different sorts of priors. Yeah. And also it speaks to, to a strong duality and not people to redundancy between cost functions and prior beliefs. I think acknowledging that is really important. And, and the reason I'm safe to that so emphatically is I think it speaks to a lot of the points and questions you've been asking. So, first of all, what, do, what, me, what metrics do we measure? Yeah. You could argue the ultimate metrics um, are going to be the subject of prior beliefs, which is reiterating the conclusion of, of, of your rehearsing the issues you know, for the, uh, the last answer. It also speaks to your point on the previous slide about intersubject variability. At the end of the day, one could argue, and I'm not going to do it, but one could argue the complete class theory dissolve all the worries about irrationality. Furthermore, it tells you exactly what you have to measure for this subject 
it's that pride believes that they're going to be taken. Furthermore, that tells you if that is true, then you know what your optional design is. It's just that desire, experimental design that enables you to disclose the beliefs of, of that person about themselves. And that can be operationalized. Right. And I think coming to your question on this side, the previous side, I think that's the theorist's role. I think, I think that, you know, if, <clears throat> I got the sense that uh, you know, when asked questions about the free energy principle, I, you know, I mean, do you really believe the brain works that way? It may or may not do that. That wasn't really the point. The point was to provide a framework that you could go to literally in the, you know, the uh, GUI and plug in your favorite paradigm and ask the question, if I simulate responses, do those responses have sufficient information to disintegrate between my two theories about how this subject or this animal is actually behaving? And of course, those two theories are, at the end of the day, going to be reducible, if the complete class theory is correct, to just different sorts of prior beliefs. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I'll try to get the two of you in touch. Maybe organize the next conference with economists. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we want to take uh, the perspective of utility maximization, which is um, not necessarily the maximization of the individual um, at the moment, but which is um, built in literally as a maximization in, in evolutionary fitness. So it is very easy to show that, for example, any risk attitude that is, I mean, any positive, uh, any risk seeking or risk avoidance is actually irrational um, from the, when looking at the amount of liquid that an animal gets over the day when it performs. Um, and, um, and that is still not counted as irrationality, but could call it like that, because the thing is, the animal gets less liquid when it shows any nonlinear, um, I mean, any risk attitude at all, rather than risk neutrality. And the reason why they show not risk neutrality is some evolutionary, uh, we assume it's some evolutionary reason why risk seeking or risk avoidance is beneficial. And, and the, we can make a long list, it's far too long here, why it is useful to be risk seeking in some situations, risk averse in other situations. Although both situations would be counted as irrational, so I have difficulties with the word irrational. Yeah. Um, the Kahneman thing, most of it can actually be explained um, by probability distortion, by adaptive coding, it can be explained biologically, by neuroscience, it can be explained by phenomenal, phenomena of behavior. Um, the main thing that can probably be least explained is the so-called loss aversion. But, but there are ideas why that is the case also. And by the way, the, the risk, um, uh, uh, an explicit risk signal, is, is absolutely mainstream economics as it uh, um, applies to the so-called mean variance approach to utility theory. This is one way of assessing utility theory by Markowitz, 1952. And it's, it's still in the mainstream economy. Um, so, so I think it's, it's a part of the Understanding why utility is not linear. Then you want an explicit risk signal and you want an explicit expected value signal, which you then combine. That, that's the idea of the mean variance approach for markets. Sorry, I missed that one. Why, why do you want a risk? Um, risk? It's, it's simply the expected utility is the um, expected value plus the weighting factor times variance. That's the so mean variance approach to, to expect utility. It's, it's a standard expected utility. The other utility that and, I, and that why, I why talked about was scaling. Well, you, 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 you can get anything. You can get anything. You can get concave and convex. What I was talking about was this, the scalar utility, but when we, when we found this utility signal, in, uh, this uh, risk signal in the orbital frontal cortex, um, we published it many years ago, then we, we were very keen to, to line that up with the mean variance approach of this book. So I, I think we can have only one last uh, quick question, and then, <laughs> because we need to give back the room to the... To I wanted to add another factor which is more theoretical, very quick. 
Um, there's an effect coming from information theory. So if you have near-optimal information extraction, sometimes that is inefficient. So even if it's optimal, there's an inefficiency which sits above the information you need. This extra space um, may, well, that's a phenomenon that can be observed. It gives you room to maneuver. So in other words, you get curiosity, well, not entirely for free, but you get it with very cheap extra cost. That's something that, that also is an effect that's mathematical. It's not basically tied to a particular um, neural substrate or so. So there may be other, other ways why it's not irrational to actually explore. Okay. So I think, uh, Jacqueline, if you want to add something? No, I okay. Okay, so thank you everyone again. Uh, see you tomorrow for the development of psychology session. <laughs> <laughs>